Hey guys, I'm Lee Turley. I am here with Mark Montgomery. So gracious to take some time and join us today. Mark, give us a uh, kind of a rundown of your entrepreneurial background as well as just I mean, some personal background and tell us what you're doing these days. Uh, well, uh, let's uh, we'll start at the beginning and go forward very quickly. Uh, I, I'm always curious about what people's parents do. Um, I think it informs a lot about who who you are as a uh, you know as a person and it informs a lot of what you do. So. Um, my, my uh, mother is a painter, and my father is a serial entrepreneur. Okay. So I kind of grew up with this weirdo right-left brain thing. And uh, yeah. the, uh, uh, the short version of that story is I was born in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I um, got bit by the music bug when I was 11 years old, Kiss Double Platinum, um, and just wanted to do, I just wanted to work close to that business um, my whole life. Um, I learned every job basically in the music business except working at a record company. And I had done most of that by the time I was in my mid-twenties. I uh, decided that I wanted to um, be a big big fish in a small pond for a while. Uh, then decided if, you know, once I had achieved that, that it was time to become a small fish in a big pond. Uh, yeah. I moved to Nashville in 1991 uh, with $800, a crazy girl and my drummer from my rock and roll band and uh, we rented a uh, house off of Nolensville Road which is kind of in the weird at the time it was in a very weird section of town yeah um, and uh, didn't know a soul but knew that, that this was a place you know it had enough trees I had been to LA and New York and it was just too that was just too much and it just this felt like the right place to be and then turns out uh, you know the 90s were quite the boom you know for this town I've watched it grow um, you know, it's currently shrinking a little. Our business is shrinking a little bit. I'd make the argument that it was too big anyway. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it started uh, my first business when I was 14. I started cutting lawns. Okay. Uh, I had a friend who was 16 who had a car, or actually a truck and a trailer, and I had a lawnmower. Um, and I figured out that I could, you know, walk door to door and get one job, or I could go to a real estate company and get 10. Uh, nice. So uh, we started doing um, cutting lawns for real estate companies, and my uh, my partner eventually kind of flaked out, and then I got into um, uh, tutoring um, wealthy families' children on how to use computers, uh, because Very in high nice. school I was a little yeah. bit of a computer hacker. Okay. And um, you know, uh, from there have just kind of uh, been involved in. Lots of you know different things. I've done everything from manage coffee shops to I mean, fill in the blank. I was a tour manager, a road man. I mean, it was just kind of anything. Yeah. Um, when I got here, um, I came here to be a, a musician uh, and a songwriter. Um, big fish in a small, a small fish in a big pond. Uh, that didn't work out so well the first round, and uh, I ended up um, learning a bunch of the supply chain business around the, the distribution of records. Okay. Um, so started with uh, on the pressing room floor uh, of a vinyl pressing plant. Um, oh, that's cool. And uh, in those uh, in the early '90s is when CDs were really just beginning to take hold. And we had a uh, we had an interesting um, sideline business of brokering the, the manufacturing of CDs. And so I learned that business, and then eventually started one of, of my own. Um, put an 800 number in my apartment, bought a Mac Color Classic, and started a company. Which um, color? Uh, it, well, it just it was a color computer. It was a. Oh, I got you. Th this was I even you before the iMac. No, 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 no. That was way. This was way before that. Oh, okay. This is back in the old days. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we, um, uh, I built that company up pretty quickly, and then uh, inevitably um, used that as leverage to to uh, buy my way into uh, a ownership in a studio complex. Okay. Uh, and uh, in 1994, we started building websites. Okay. Um, so pretty pretty early, we were, uh, you know, I was tinkering around with the web, uh, and then in 1996 we started selling music directly to consumers online. Uh, and I don't know if you remember, and you, I'll actually send you this video. You may want to cut it right here and put this video in. Okay. Uh, the UPS commercial where uh, the guys are all sitting around their computer, yeah, waiting for the first order to come in, and then the orders start coming in, and and they're all like high fiving each other, and then they're all like. Holy shit! There's too much. Am I allowed to say that? Sure. Uh, uh, there's too much, and 
I had that moment on, on uh, April 20th in, in uh, 1996, and I sat there and I went, I don't know what this is, but this is big. And so that kind of took me off in a, in a whole other direction, and, and that led to the formation of a, a company called Echo Music. Um, we built that company uh, over, r really over about a, an eight-year period. It really had two sort of distinct lives. It was it, it, initially it was a physical goods distribution company. Yeah. Um, and after uh, uh, playing with Napster, um, we made a decision that we should be out of that business as soon as we can get out of it. And so we basically uh, ran against a strategic plan to divest, uh, divest ourselves of that business and to get more and more into the internet business. And in 2000. Three, I met a guy named Doli Stepniewski, who is uh, one of the best coders I have ever come in contact with. He's a savant, okay. really, and actually one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet and one hell of a bass player. Wow. And uh, I convinced him to leave his company where he was and to, to chase this crazy idea of, man, if we could just put all this, this consumer data together in, in, a, in a single container where as a marketing person I could look at it and know how to better communicate, um, how to communicate more accurately, how to communicate more in a much more targeted way, we could really do some serious damage with this. And uh, so we set out to build that. 14 months later, we had a working prototype. Um, in 2005, we sold the distribution company uh, okay. and kept the direct-to-consumer piece, but the, the, the sort of wholesale business and the manufacturing and all that stuff sold all that off. Um, Some poor, unsuspecting... Well, uh, <laughs> actually, that guy did very well with that business. I mean, yeah. we, had, we had 500, you know, big customers. Yeah. And I think, I mean, he's still doing, and I think it's, you know, it's dwindling down. Yeah. I wouldn't, still, I don't want to be no riding, complaints. I don't know, yeah. yeah, I don't want to necessarily be riding it down. And then we, um, I mean, effectively, we, we went from kind of a bootstrap operation to a bank finance business. Um, and uh, in 2006, we took one round of angel money from a, a West Coast firm actually based in Seattle called Acorn Ventures. Okay. Um, we sold them a small interest for a, a good chunk of money. Mm, and nice. uh, we uh, exited the business in February of 2007. Uh, I learned one of my biggest entrepreneurial lessons uh, to that point, never sell 51% okay. and trust but ver verify. Yeah. <coughs> um, and then I, uh, you know, for the first time probably in 15 years, had, had a boss. Um, and uh, I lasted just around two years. Um, I, let's just say I'm not a very good corporate citizen. Yeah. Um, I don't feel like I really belong reporting to someone who doesn't understand what I do. Okay. Um, and is unfortunately too frequently the case, um, acquiring companies tend to destroy the, the thing that they were most attracted to about their acquisitions. Mm -hmm. And through a series of, um, uh, you know, things that I don't think any of us could have ever foreseen, um, it, it became apparent to me that the, the company was, was going to be radically transformed uh, uh, in a way that didn't meet the vision. And so in 2009, I left. I want to create an environment that allows me to work fractionally on somewhere between a half a dozen and a dozen projects simultaneously. Okay. Some for money, some for equity, and some for my, that are my own ideas. Okay. And so, uh, you know, f Flow is really that platform. Um, we're, it's, we're very early in its development. So what I tell you it is today could be radically different in six weeks. Um, the original idea was different than it is today. Okay. But I'm, I'm basing it around a couple of very simple rules. Must be present to win. Okay. You know? um, it is not a business that is geared around making short-term money, meaning if you need a salary, you don't fit it flow. Okay. Um, people who have long runways fit really well at flow, meaning I, I'm fortunate to not have to earn a paycheck today. Okay. Um, I would much rather use my intelligence, my Rolodex, and my resources to invest in uh, people who have great ideas um, but need help than I would in charging them a fee to help them. So uh, Flow's basic model is very simple. Um, we are a f it's a for-hire entity. We do have a couple of clients already. Um, 
who we don't discuss publicly because a lot of who we work with are, are fairly high profile. Okay. Um, and uh, those clients retain us for any number of things. Okay. Um, the second piece is um, it is a vehicle for investing. Um, so I do some personal investing, and then I represent um, uh, you know people who have large amounts of capital that they want to deploy, and okay. so I bring that into the marketplace and um, will help a company get into shape um, to, to get to that yeah. point uh, uh, where, where they have an investable story. Sometimes it's with my own money, sometimes it's with someone else's money. Hmm. Um, and then the third thing is is that when you kind of look at the group of people that I've assembled in, in the sanity, <clears throat> there's a lot of great ideas floating around in the room. And so Flo will begin to um, get all those ideas up and begin to prioritize them and then pick several of them and work on them. Okay. So it gives me this giant sandbox to play in with really smart kids that have cool yeah. toys. You know, and in that, in that cadre of folks, there's an industrial designer who designed the first power book for Apple and wow. then went on to run Nike's consumer footwear business. Um, there is a, a guy, I, uh, I call him, he's, he's the Dr. Johnny Fever of the group. I don't know if I'm dating myself, but uh, there was an old show called WKRP in Cincinnati that had this cool disc jockey named Johnny Fever. Well, we've got a former disc jockey who started a social media company who exited that, and he's in this. And he's a big, um, he, he's an expert of the narrative. You know, I think that today in our, in our where, this, where, the, where business in general is going, the brand, the brand is the story. Yeah. You know? um, it's no longer about telling stories. It's about the story of who you are, of mm -hmm. who you are as a company, whether it's an individual or whether it's Nike. <clears throat> and so um, we're focused a little bit around this idea of how do you tell the story to the marketplace and how do you use traditional mechanisms and, and new mechanisms and how do they work together. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we have kind of that side of the house and then we have pure technologists who have built scale, giant scale platforms. Um, we have intellectual property attorneys. Uh, you know, so we've got a, an amalgamation of about 20 people um, none of who need the money yeah. and are more interested in working on great projects and solving great problems. Um, That's very cool. So, so we'll see you at TED sometime soon, huh? Uh, I, <laughs> I, maybe. Yeah. I mean, uh, that would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody it's got to work. I mean, at, yeah. the, at the end of the day, um, you know, the, uh, it'll be, it's going to be, it's a, it's a really great experiment. And, it, and you know, I told the, uh, <clears throat> I told a friend of mine this the other day. I, I think that, for me, I'm doing it right when I'm when I'm absolutely terrified and absolutely enthralled simultaneously. That to me is what tells me I'm on the right track. Yeah. When I just I'm scared shitless. Yeah. And I can't stop thinking about it. Yeah. Um, that's that's absolutely. the place that I'm looking to be all the time. No, that's awesome. You have a that's a great you have a good story. I mean, so far that's uh, that's quite the. Um, yeah. Well, watch I, it for think, twelve months. I could end up flat on my ass. I think that yeah, but still, you got to uh, you got to to risk big in order to to achieve big. So, Absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, I know quite a few entrepreneurs in town that would you know love to have that story and are working on that story for themselves. So that's well, awesome. we need more of it.